Good evening and thank you for coming. I would like to give a briefing of day two of our investigation of the fatal accident involving Spaceship Two. Today the investigators did extensive work on scene. They found almost all of the important parts of the space vehicle that we need in order to complete our investigation. They were able to remove several of those parts into a hangar where they can investigate them further. That will help not having so many sites that need to be protected. As I mentioned yesterday, the, the wreckage was sprayed over an area about five miles long from northeast to southwest. Among other things, they found the fuel tanks, the oxidizer tanks, and the engine, and all were intact, showed no signs of burn through, no signs of, of being breached, and those will also be investigated further. We also conducted a number of interviews today, but as I mentioned yesterday, we have several more interviews to go. As I mentioned yesterday, we are not divulging the results of those interviews until we are finished because we don't want subsequent interviews to be affected by previous interviews. I also mentioned yesterday that we had an unusual amount of data regarding this accident because it was a test flight. So because it was a test flight, we had telemetry, we had video from within the spaceship, from without the spaceship, from the ground, from several sources. We have a number of eyewitnesses, so we have uh, quite a bit of data that we wouldn't normally have in an operational accident. We had several sources of data that were, that were electronic data on the ship that are non-volatile, which means once they lose power, they don't lose their data. And we have quite a few experts who are good at taking even damaged data chips. We're taking several of them back to our lab because several were damaged, taking those back to our lab to read them out to, to get the information off of them. <clears throat> One of the things we found today was on our, we found based on video data and telemetry, and I would like to explain that to you, but before I do that, I would like to emphasize that what I'm about to say is a statement of fact and not a statement of cause. We are a long way from finding cause. We still have months and months of investigation to do, a lot that we don't know. We have extensive data sources to go through. So I want to emphasize that what I'm about to say is not a statement of cause, but is instead a statement of fact. In order to explain what I'm about to say, I want to explain the concept of feathering. This is the space vehicle in normal flight, and these two tail booms that extend back are referred to as feathers. After the space vehicle is launched and goes up to the apogee, then when it starts to return to the atmosphere, the procedure is to move the feathers into a position where the entire body rotates in order to create more drag as the space vehicle is re-entering the atmosphere. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about some information we discovered about the feathering function. The spaceship was released normally and after it was released, shortly after it was released, the rocket engine ignited. About nine seconds after the engine ignited, the telemetry data told us, showed us that the feather parameters changed from lock to unlock. Now in order for feathering this action to be commanded by the pilots, two actions must occur. One is the lock unlock handle must be moved from lock to unlock. And number two is the feathering handle must be moved to the feather position. Approximately two seconds after the feathering parameters indicated that the lock-unlock lever was moved from lock to unlock. The feathers moved toward the extended position, the deployed position, even though the feather handle itself had not been moved. And this occurred at a speed just above 
approximately Mach 1.0. Shortly after the feathering occurred, the telemetry data terminated and the video data terminated. The engine burn was normal up until the extension of the feathers. There is a camera in the cockpit. There are several cameras in the, in the space vehicle. There is a camera in the cockpit mounted on the ceiling that looks forward and shows the actions of the pilots and the instruments. And review of that camera is consistent with the telemetry data and shows that the feather lock-unlock lever was moved by the co-pilot from the lock position to the unlock position. Normal launch procedures are that after the, the release, the ignition of the rocket and acceleration, that the, feather, the, the feathering devices are not to be moved the unlock, the lock unlock lever is not to be moved into the unlock position until the acceleration up to Mach 1.4. Instead, as I indicated, that occurred approximately Mach 1.0. So again, I want to emphasize that we have not determined the cause. I am not stating that this is the cause of this mishap. We have months and months of investigation to determine what the cause was. We'll be looking at training issues, we'll be looking at was there pressure to continue testing, we'll be looking at safety culture, we'll be looking at the design, the procedure. We've got many, many issues to look into much more extensively before we can determine the cause. So I emphasize once again what I just told you was not a statement of cause but rather a statement of fact. There's much more that we don't know and our investigation is far from over. We will continue the investigation tomorrow. I anticipate having another press conference tomorrow. Please visit ntsb.gov and at NTSB, our Twitter site, to get the time and location of tomorrow's press conference. With that, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions you Mr. might Hart, have. Is it, fair yes, to please. Say, is it fair to say, sir, that you're edging towards the possibility of some sort of pilot error? Well, we are not edging towards anything at this point. We are not ruling anything out. We are looking at all of these issues that I mentioned to determine what was the root cause of this mishap. So this that feathering is was... a possibility, sir. Well, we are looking at a number of possibilities, including that possibility. Yes. This was supposed yes, to occur please. at 1.4, and instead it occurred at 1.0. That's what you're saying? The lock-unlock lever was not to be moved into unlock until the acceleration to 1.4, and it actually occurred around 1.0. And That's what correct. is that in miles, regular speed? That depends on the altitude. I have to get back to you with that. All right. Yes, please. Uh, are you saying that the, uh, do you have videotape showing, do I hear you right, do you have videotape showing this? The video cameras yes. show what I described, yes. The video camera in the cockpit. Facing and there, are, there were six cameras, it's, it's been reported, is that the correct There were other cameras on that, on the space vehicle as well. And we will be exploring those. Again, that's part all, of the extensive data source to that we are looking at to determine the cause of this accident. Right. Question. You With described, the, you described yes, um, to, uh, events that needed to take place for the feather to move and yes. did both of those actually happen but just not in the time that they would have happened to actually use the feather both of those did not happen the right. lock unlock lever was moved from lock to unlock but the feathering lever was not moved so this was an uncommanded what we would call an uncommanded feather which means the feather occurred without the feather uh, lever being moved into the feather position. So there's two things. One is that the lock unlock happened early, and the second is that the feather moved without being commanded? The, 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 the two feathers moved without being commanded, but the feathering lever in the cockpit was not moved. Right. So yes, there, please. What speed did it attain? Did it go past 1.1 mile in the vehicle? I will have to get back to you with how it, this happens two seconds after after the lock unlock, and I will have to get back to you with the actual speed at which that occurred. And the design of the aircraft, it, does it require both levers to be moved for the feathers to activate? The design of the aircraft is that in order for the pilots to make these move, they have to do two things. And the two things are move the lock unlock lever from lock to unlock, and then also move the feather. But is there a lever. safeguard that if, it, if you don't actually command the 
feathers to move that they should not move according to the design, do you know? That, that we will have to explore. And I'm sorry I should have been repeating the questions and forgot to, but... Does the same pilot do both actions or are they separate actions? One does one, the other does the other. Do you know? Normal procedure is for the co-pilot to move the lock, unlock lever into unlock. I'd have to get back to you with regard to who normally moves the feather lever. I'm sorry. I, next time I'll repeat the question. I'm, I apologize for not repeating so, the question. Just to clarify, yes, please. the second action did not take place and you're sure that that didn't take place? The question is, did the second action take place and the answer is the second action did not take place. Well, yes, please. And, and so do you believe there was an aerodynamic breakup of this aircraft? Uh, during flight? The, the question is, do we believe that there was an aerodynamic breakup of this craft during flight? There was a, certainly an in-flight separation, whether it was aerodynamic or some other reason, is part of the investigation yet to be done. When yes, you please. say that the, uh, the tanks, the two tanks and the engine landed intact, you mean intact, intact, they survived the whole fall and you retrieved them uh, um, all in, you know, the various whole pieces or showing that there was no explosion or anything? The, the or question was about the, on, the, the, on the fuel tanks and the engine. Yes, I did say that the fuel tanks were found intact with no indication of breach or burn through, and so was the engine as well. Two more questions, and then I will terminate the conference. Yes, please. Um, was this lock-on-lock -lock, uh, movement such that it would have uh, caused the to the craft to fall apart? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing would your question. Would that have caused the, the craft to fall apart? The lock unlock was the was the lock. The question was was the lock unlock part of the what caused this aircraft to come apart? What we know is that when after it was unlocked, the feathers moved into the deployed position, and two seconds later, we saw disintegration. That's that's the fact. We'll find out the analysis as a part of the investigation. Question. Last yes. question, please. Question. Yes, if please. we if you were to recreate this, it's kind of, please excuse what I'm saying here. We take another aircraft. The co-pilot does what he did. What would normally happen? The question is what would normally happen in another aircraft. These aircraft are built one at a time. I couldn't tell you what might happen in another aircraft. These are very unique machines. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much for the press conference. We'll see you again tomorrow night. Thank you.